Good evening. We're gathered tonight here in celebration of the Greek Independence Day, uh, which was March 25th. Tonight we're uh, uh, presenting a lecture series that uh, EMCA is sponsoring and uh, the HEPA District of New York uh, is uh, hosting in conjunction with our chapter Delphi 25 here in Manhattan. And we will talk about some of the historical aspects of the uh, Greek Revolution of 1821. Those who are interested in Hellenic American history is probably one of the most cited uh, historians uh, of early Hellenic American history in the, in the United States. He is known as the uh, first uh, historian of the Hellenes in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, he's, he's, he had created from the beginning uh, guides for immigrants who were coming uh, into the United States so they could learn about the country. Uh, its laws, um, the civics, uh, how to get jobs, what's happening in the United States, and he did this state by state. He also created the, uh, the, the what he calls the uh, business guide, the Hellenic American business guide. This particular guide uh, was a guide that had every single business that was owned by Hellenes in the United States, state by state, city by city, with addresses and, and uh, locations and names of the of the appropriate uh, companies. No one has ever duplicated this before, by the way. He started this series in about 1908. Uh, he was a he was a diplomat. Uh, he was a lawyer trained at the University of Athens. He came to the United States and also studied law and, and got his law degree. And uh, besides a historian, he has written a lot of books about various topics. <coughs> Most of us didn't know, actually, who were in the history, uh, history world, know that he was a member of a HEPA. But one day when we were at a HEPA meeting at uh, Delphi 25, um, someone mentioned something, and I, and, I, and I started to talk a little bit about history, and I mentioned the name Canutus. And then Nadiri, who's the president of Del Delphi 25, said to me, oh, Canutus. He was, he was a president, a past president of, uh, of Delphi. So Canutus, uh, again, uh, really a, a figure that if you look at any book, any Hellenic American history book, and you go to the bibliography, you will always see Canutus cited. Not only by, by, uh, by Hellenes, but also by Hellenic American historians. There were books written, for example, in the early, in the early 20th century that all, when you read them, when you go through page by page, you're looking at what they're saying, and you're saying to yourself, this is Canutus. And then you go to the back and you say, well, they quote, in fact, that it was, in fact, Canutus. So we're very, very proud of this. This is the first event, and we decided to do it on uh, March 25th, uh, because it's a very important day. And it's also piggybacking on what we did at, with AHEPA, with District uh, 5 and 6, with regards to Lucky Day on Ellis Island. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, first bring up uh, for a few words the uh, Theodore Stamas, uh, Order of Ahepa Governor, District 6. Good evening, Kalispera Sas. Welcome, everybody. Uh, nice to see a good turnout here for the inaugural lecture series for Seraphim Canutis. Uh, as Lou mentioned, this is going to be an event we're going to do at least annually, maybe more than that. We can't think of a more worthy um, patron for our lecture series at Serafine Canutis. And Lou gave you some background on that. I'm not going to go into anything more than that. I think we have our two resident scholars from District 6. We have uh, Lou Katzos and Peter Giacomis, and we're all interested to, see, to hear their presentations. But again, I just uh, want to thank Lou. I want to thank EMCA, also the district for sponsoring it, and Delphi 25 uh, for sponsoring the event. Uh, on March 23rd, Several uh, people, uh, Heppens uh, and others, invited to the uh, White House by President Trump. At that time, the President uh, made a proclamation, and I'd like to read to you the proclamation that, his, that uh, President Trump did for this occasion. On this celebration of Greek Independence Day, we reflect on the common bonds of history and heritage that connect the United States and Greece. Our nation, nations share cultural, economic, and defense interests. 
but the foundation of our abiding friendship is our unwavering commitment to liberty, our shared love of democratic institutions. As a cradle of Western civilization and the birthplace of democracy, Greece has a rich and glorious heritage, replendent in its influential contributions to literature, philosophy, and science. The ancient Greeks fostered the timeless ideal of human liberty, which inspired our nation's founders as they drafted our constitution and established the republic. The legacy of ancient Greece carries on today as liberty continues to serve as a beacon of hope to all who, who long for a better life. It was an honor to welcome Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras to the White House last year. His visit underscored the importance of bilateral relationships and our ongoing strategic cooperation on issues such as law enforcement, counterterrorism, and matters of defense, energy, commerce, and trade. Greece continues to meet its NATO obligation on defense spending and serves as a gracious host for our naval forces in Suda Bay. Our Greek-American partnership is strong, and we are grateful to have such a tremendous ally as a friend in Greece. Our nation con nations continue to expand their economic and commercial ties, creating jobs and opportunities for investment, trade, on both sides of the Atlantic. This year, the United States is proud to serve as the honored country at the 2018 Salonika International Fair. Thessaloniki, not Thessaloniki, yeah. This historic business and trade exhibition will showcase American technology, enterprise, and innovation, and will further enhance the partnership and cooperation between our great nations. In 2018, we also celebrate 70 years of the Fulbright Greece, a program of education and cultural exchanges between the United States and Greece. Fulbright Greece, the oldest Fulbright program in Europe, is the flagship international exchange program sponsored by our government. Since 1948, the program has awarded grants to more than 5,000 Greek and American citizens to study, teach, or conduct research enriching both of our countries. The United States and Greece have an, have an enduring bond based on mutual respect, shared values, and abiding commitment to freedom and sovereignty. More than 1.3 million Americans claim Greek origin. The Greek American community has made countless positive contributions to our nation and has played a vital role in maintaining a strong relationship with Greece. On this 197th anniversary celebration of Greek Independence Day, we honor Greece as a strong, faithful ally and valued partner in promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the world. Now, therefore, I, I'll read what he says. Now, therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim March 25th, 2018, as Greek Independence Day, a national day of celebration of Greek American democracy. I call upon the people of the United States to observe this day with appropriate ceremonies and activities. In witness where, uh, whereof I have hereunto set my hand this 22nd day of March, in the year of our Lord, 2018, and the independence of the United States of America, the 242nd year, and this is signed by Donald Trump. Thank you. We have with us today the, uh, both the Council and the Council General of the Hellenic Republic. Um, and uh, if you can, uh, Dr. Kutras, uh, say a few words uh, to the audience. Good evening, everybody, and Kronia Bola for our National Independence Day. Yesterday, when I was in Philadelphia, we were actually our consul, our new consul, Ms. Lana Zahu, we were in Philadelphia, and it was amazing. This 
inside the, the cold, the, the severe, severe weather conditions. Actually, after the church started to snow, but fortunately God <laughs> intervened and uh, changed the situation a bit, and the sun went out. But it was very, very cold. Beautiful feelings to see that. From small children at the age of three until the age of 103. Amazing. And congratulations to all of us for that, and especially to you. So we're here today to a series of lectures, and this man started in 1908, publishing a journal. So we are here today, 110 years after the first try to publish this in uh, the Greek American journal. Today, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear friends, it is very important, maybe more important than that time, because the times at that time were different. Today we are living in a very difficult and strange period. And our homeland, Greece, needs you. Needs you desperately. And needs you not only to go there and support the economy of Greece, spending your dollars during your summer vacations. Greece needs you more here than in Greece. And why is that? Because everybody knows that you, as a member of the HEPAS and other organizations in the United States, we have to have a say in the American politics. And uh, Lou knows very well what I'm talking about. So, we have to work together we, as representatives of the Hellenic Republic here, and you, as leaders of our community, to achieve that. It's not easy, but I think we can do it. Thank you very much, and congratulations again for what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We decided really a short time ago to put this program together. And uh, we are very fortunate to have some very talented people, uh, both in IHEPA and, and in EMCA, and people with uh, very good backgrounds, uh, and also in, in historical backgrounds. So I'd like to introduce uh, our first uh, actual performer, Dimitrios Tsinopoulos, who's a tenor. And he will sing Oyeros Vimos for Marcos Botsadis by Pablos Correa. Actually, when I first met him, I, I looked at him and I said, what do you do? He said, I'm an opera singer. I'm uh, interested in starting a Hellenic American uh, opera company, basically with some, with some other people. To me, this was like a flash bulb went off because I said, oh, OK. So he would be perfect, I said to myself, to start, uh, to start the event. And I said, what, what type of operas uh, you know, what type of operas are you saying? He said, well, we're doing Marcos Botsetis, which you did the other day, which was yes. very successful. Yes in uh, Long Island City. And I said, what, what else, uh, what other operas? And he mentioned Paleologos, actually, which also fascinated me because I, towards the end of the year, I was thinking of doing an event on Paleologos. And wouldn't it be nice to have an opera, Paleologos opera, have a little bit of presentation about Paleologos, the fall of Constantinople, because we were going to do it on May 29th. It's going to be about May 29th, 1453. We do a little presentation. Boom, we have an opera. So here we are. Ποιος ξέρει από το μήμα μου Τι δέντρο θα φυτρώσει
about uh, yourself, about the opera company, and what your goals are. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I met Maestro Cordis uh, not long ago. We had the opportunity of performing the, having the first Pan American performance of the opera Marcos Borsalis, and it was at uh, Bard Conservatory uh, in upstate New York. And after we all performed that together, it was a specific type of music that I was not aware of until very recently. And I was not aware of how beautiful Greek opera was. And I remember one night, I was just going through YouTube listening to music, and I, uh, I stumbled upon some Greek opera, and I did not know what it was. I thought I might as well check it out. And I instantly was immersed by the beauty and also by the association that we feel as Hellenes with Hellenic opera. So that's about when I started uh, researching, trying to find a little bit more out about it. And just by coincidence, I met with Maestro Gorgis and we had the first event. And I remember something very interesting. I had this conversation with a friend of mine who was Italian, and they were telling me about, we were talking about our heritage, Greek heritage and Italian heritage. And they said to me, well, you know, we have opera at all. You, you can't take that from us. And I told him, ah, oh, but you're wrong. And I introduced him to some of the Greek operas. And I have to say that he was, he was very enamored by it and he really liked it. So our goal is to establish Hellenic opera as part of standard performed operas. Because we, don't, we believe that these operas have nothing that, is, that doesn't qualify them as equivalents or even superior to other operas that are out there. And let's not forget that you have Russian operas that are being performed constantly. You have Czech operas that are being performed constantly. And these languages are very difficult, while Greek is not difficult to sing, actually. It's just it's very similar to Italian. So our goal is to promote that and to try to um, get more people to learn and to hear and this to uh, experience the beauty of our Greek operas. And you know, it's only 200 years of history, and I really believe that it's, it's, worth, a, uh, it's worth a chance, to give it a chance to, to flourish and to, and to grow, and maybe to become part of what we wish it to be, part of the international opera scene. Thank you. George, if you can say a couple of words for the commissioner, for the uh, governor. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Yasos, Nikanete, Kalispera. I see a couple of friends in this room. It's always great to see you and uh, be welcome. I want to thank Marina for inviting me here today. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you. Unfortunately, the governor could not be here. However, he does send his regards. He wishes you great success on your lecture series. He wants you to know that he's here to support the Greek community and admires everything that we've done, not only for this great state of New York, but around the world. And I uh, just wanted to take this moment to wish everybody a happy Greek Independence Day. All right, thank you. The next person I'm gonna introduce is someone that is, uh, is dear and close to me. Uh, that's uh, Peter Yakubis. Uh, he's a military historian who works with the uh, Polydismos Museum of Greek History, showcasing Hellenism in all its forms. I did, in fact, uh, interview him uh, on Cosmos FM because he is writing a fantastic book that has to do with the Hellenic Americans and Philhellenes during the Balkan Wars of uh, 1912 and 1913. Don't forget, for those who may not know, that from the United States, about 40,000, 40,000 Hellenic Americans left this country to fight in the Balkan Wars. And, um, and Peter's putting a great book together. Hopefully it will be out uh, within the next, uh, what? Summer. Summer? Oh, beautiful, okay, fantastic. Peter, uh, yeah, please. Uh, the title, the title uh, that he has is uh, The Legacy of General Yanis Makaniyanis. Thank you, Lou, for the introduction. The legacy of uh, General Yanis Matriyanis is, uh, is a long one. It spans over 150 years, 
And to many of us, his name and image conjure up visions of heroic fighters battling Turks for the creation of an independent Greece on March 25th, 1821. However, what do we really know about the general? And what of his legacy? First off, Magriani was born in 1797, and his actual name is Ioannis Triandafilos. He was the son of a poor family in the village of Oriti in the area of Doris. He was orphaned at a very young age when his father was killed in a skirmish with forces of Ali Pasha. Life was difficult, to say the least. He was given to a wealthy family as a foster son. He was rebellious and proud, and by his early teens, he set out to carve out his own future. Having a keen sense for trade, he slowly amassed a respectable amount of money, establishing himself as a respectable businessman and trader. In 1820, as events unfolded around him, he was approached by the Filigia Teria, the secret anti-Ottoman society, and joined their ranks after much consideration. He was a man of convictions. He took the final oath when he was fully dedicated to the revolution. As a trusted member of the society, he was immersed in the preparations for the actual revolution. In March of 1821, he left for Patra in Peloponiso, pretending to be on a business trip. His actual mission was to inform the local members of the Filigueteria on the state of affairs and the plans that were at hand. After meeting with Odysseus Andruzos, he returned to Arta a couple days before the revolution commenced and was arrested by the Turkish authorities. He was held for 90 days and then managed to escape. In August of 1821, he took up arms under the chieftain Gogos Bagolas and entered into armed service against the Ottomans. During the revolution, he was very active and fought bravely in many battles. He was wounded in action multiple times, and during the Battle of Athens, he was shot three times in one night defending his fellow soldiers. After the Turkish surrender of the Acropolis in June of 1822, Magliani's was appointed supervisor of public order, and by January 1823, he took a hard stand against the arbitrary oppression of the population and thievery. By the summer of that year, he fought with Nikitaras in the east eastern part of central Greece, and in October, he led the Rumeliotti forces in the Peloponnese on behalf of Yorgos Kuduriotis' government against the rebels in the Civil War. For his actions, he was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General, followed by promotion to Lieutenant General in August of 1824, and then full general a year later. He continued to use his military skills on the field of battle, employing guerrilla tactics throughout his campaigns against the Turco-Egyptian forces sent to take back the Peloponnese. And during the 1825 battle at Mili, he was again wounded and had to be carried off to Nafrio. After recovering sufficiently, he was betrothed to the daughter of a prominent Athenian and was forever linked to the city. In June of 1826, Ibrahim Pasha was able to capture the city of Athens, but not the Acropolis. Macriani helped organize the defenses and became the provisional commander of the garrison. He was wounded again during that battle, and those wounds troubled him and followed him the rest of his life. Nevertheless, he participated in the last phase of the war in the spring of 1827 during the battles of Pirea and Anarathos. Macriani's involvement in the emerging nation, which is about to reach its most critical phase of its own legacy, is as follows. In 1821, Ioannis Kapodrisias appoints Macriani to the position of general leader of the executive authority of the Peloponnese based in Argos. Despite being a person who received virtually no education, he taught himself how to write at the age of 32, expressly to set down his experiences, and on the 26th of February, 1829, he begins to write his now famous memoirs. While writing those memoirs, a series of unique historical events are transpiring, and Magrianis is not far from the action. In the restructuring of the Hellenic military of 1830, Magriani is made a brigadier general. However, he is harboring growing opposition to the new Greek government and its policies, and he quickly withdraws his support. He is critical of what he perceives as an authoritarian approach to Kapodistia's rule, and is worried that his home region will not be included in the newly liberated Greek state. He is subsequently stripped of his position for supporting a constitutional form of government. 
during the succeeding government of the newly appointed Greek king, Prince Otto of Bavaria, Magriani was, early, was an early supporter. However, it quickly evaporated once he realized that King Otto's reign was not going to support a constitution and had very little regard, if any, for the heroes of the revolution. The new royal restructuring of the armed forces had no place for the irregular bands of cleft fighters, the Amartoli, who were discarded, most of which had no means of supporting themselves. Macriani was offended by the actions of the government. These issues led Macriani to retire from active politics. But unable to stay away, he was elected to the city council of Athens in 1833 and continued to voice his strong support for a constitutional government. As the president of the city council, in 1837, he handed the king an adopted resolution for the request to grant a constitution, which was of course ignored. At a formal banquet, Macriani made a public announcement favoring his stand on the granting of a constitution. The king's prime minister dissolved the city council and placed Macriani under house arrest. On 3rd September 1843, a revolution led to the granting of the first constitution. Macriani was one of the three leaders of that movement. He also played an important part in forming of the new cabinet. He continued to write his memoirs until October of 1850. On March 16 of 1853, after refusing to denounce the so-called co-conspirators in a plot to overthrow the king, he was sentenced to death. In what many have called, of course, a prefabricated trial, he unfortunately spent 18 months in jail before he was pardoned. On October 10, 1862, King Otto was evicted and Macriani was restored to the rank he held prior to his trial and died on the 20th of April, 1864. However, now comes the point where we should look at his legacy. And I tell you that Macriani was more than just a hero amongst those revolutionaries that created what we know as Greece today. His memoir places him amongst the greatest writers of modern Greece. It is a source written from a pure Hellenic perspective, detailing the complexity of the situation. The modern reader has the opportunity to evaluate his role and the events that transpired outside of the emotional and subjective influences of the past and of the present. Knowledge of Hellenic history is tied directly to the context of how it is taught and learned. The vast majority of Greek Americans know very little of the how and the why of modern Greek state or its formation. Usually it is idealized and oversimplified. For those that seek a better understanding of the Greek struggle, here's an excellent window into the trials and tribulations of the early Hellenic kingdom, written by a participant, a man of action, a man that put his life and reputation on the line to fight for what he believed was the ultimate good, not for the one, but for the many. Roger Beaton and David Ricks in their work, The Making of Modern Greece, conclude that Magriani has a distinct legacy, one that is driven by his need to tell a story, one that will teach the next generation the true meaning of patriotism, and another that is driven by vindication. By narrating the story of his life through the lens of national history, he sets up an imaginary court in order to defend himself and attack his opponents before a jury that consists of contemporary and most importantly, of future readers. Thus, he waits the ultimate praise from history itself to amend for the pettiness of his era. In Magliani's own memoirs, we find the following significant passage in the epilogue. Well, we all work together to liberate Greece, and we need to guard her together for the powerful or the weak, not to say I. Do you know when someone should say I? When they struggle on their own to make or destroy something. When many people struggle and make something, then they should say we. We are at the we and not the I. Is a date that's always in my mind, by the way. Many times we think of the Hellenic War of Independence and we think of the 
of the fighters of the war of independence, whether it's uh, <coughs> it's uh, Kaliskakis, whether it's Kolkotronis. But many times we don't we don't discuss in these events uh, the Philippines and uh, what influence they had on the revolution. The Serbians, for example, they, they rebelled starting in 1804, and they had a series of uprisings. And uh, actually, for 30 years, they were fighting. But no one, no one really remembers, remembers the, uh, the Serbians and their fight, even though they had a fight just as severe as what was hap happening in, in, um, in the mainland of the Hellenic, of the Hellenic what is now the Hellenic Republic. And a lot of it has to do with, uh, with the Philhellenes and everyone's feelings about, about the Hellenic nation and also about the history of Elas, the ancient history in particular. I think, I think what we have to do is, is uh, discuss <clears throat> a little bit about the background of what was happening at that particular time. This is a map of the Ottoman Empire around 1817. And as you see, it had all of North Africa, it had what is now uh, Turkey, and it had obviously the Hellenic, Hellenic Republic and further north into, into Moldavia and on Wallachia and into Albania. At that particular time of uh, 1817, let's say around, uh, you know, just before the revolution, there were a lot of uh, powerful people actually within, within the uh, Ottoman Empire. And uh, some of them were, for example, Ali Pasha, Who's basically, who's basically in this area. At one point, he controlled almost all of what is now uh, continental, uh, continental Greece. Uh, he, he was in Epirus, uh, and between his two sons, they went all the way into the Moria, the Moria being the Peloponnesus. At the same time, you had another powerful uh, Pasha, who was the uh, Muhammad Ali of Egypt, who was very, who was very powerful. So there were three. There were three really main characters in the uh, in the Ottoman Empire. One of them was obviously uh, Sultan Mahmud, who at the time of 1808, when he first uh, became the Sultan, the empire was in a very weak position because, as we indicated, you had some very powerful elements within the uh, the Ottoman Empire. One was Ali of uh, Yanina. And the other one was Ali of, uh, of Egypt. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the Sultan really was not the most powerful person at the time. It was really Muhammad, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali of, of Yanina. And uh, as a matter of fact, he was extremely, extremely concerned about, about his power because it was a growing power. He was known and, uh, and uh, Professor uh, Catherine Fleming wrote a book, actually. Uh, in her, the name of the book was uh, the, the Muslim Bonaparte. And it was Ali Pasya of Yanina. And he was, in fact, the, the Muslim Bonaparte. He had, over a period of time, captured more and more areas and, and gained more and more in control. And his particular port, uh, just for, uh, for those who may not know, his particular port had both, both Muslims and Orthodox. As a matter of fact, in the court, uh, in the court of Ali, uh, the language that was used was the Hellenic language. In other words, the diplomatic language was not the Turkish. It was actually the Hellenic language. Uh, again, a very powerful individual. Then you had Mohammed Ali Pasha of Egypt, another powerful individual. And both of these individuals and the Sultan, the reason why I'm mentioning them is because you'll see further on how influential they were relating to the, uh, to the Hellenic Revolution. Within the Ottoman system, uh, they had what they call the, uh, the Malets. Uh, everyone was basically se segregated by religion. And uh, for example, this map, uh, this map probably was from the probably from the 1700s, but this particular map shows you the Musulman, meaning the, the Islamic uh, millet, the Rum, the Rum millet, which is the Orthodox. And again, the Rum, Rum means Rami. Okay, that's where we get the terminology that we use, Rami. 
you know, to the uh, to the uh, the Ottomans, we were the Romi, we were the, the Romans, we were the Rum. Uh, you have the Jewish uh, people who are basically uh, this map doesn't show the yellow that that well, but basically they were uh, towards the north. And then you have the Armenians, which you see, which you see over there. I think the colors are not coming out too good. Here's, here's where the the yellow was basically up there, where the Jewish are, and obviously where where we have Thessaloniki, because that was also a very large uh, Jewish population that came from the from fourteen from fourteen ninety two. Within within the Hellenic Republic, and historically there were three warrior societies. One was in Himara, which is uh, which is, no, uh, which is northern Epirus, or what, what is now southern Albania. The other was Suli, and the third was Mani. And all these uh, warrior societies played a very important role in the, in the revolution. The Sudotis, for example, uh, uh, for those who know Sudotico history, uh, were fighting the Ottomans for, uh, from the 1700s and were totally undefeated, war after war after war until finally they were defeated by, by Ali Pasha in 1803. And that caused a situation where they had to go to Kerkela or Corfu and some of the other islands which at the time were, were controlled by the Venetian Republic. Uh, at that time, uh, the, uh, the Venetians uh, had all the Ionian islands and they have, had the coast of uh, Dalmatia, what we call Dalmatia, and uh, they, they uh, were a very influential power before the, before the French Revolution and Napoleon. The Manyakas, uh, they also had uh, their particular societies. Uh, they were really never, never taken completely over, but all of, these, all of these, by the way, paid taxes. In other words, even though they had warrior societies, uh, and understand when we say warrior societies, they also fought as mercenaries for a lot of the wars in Europe, which we'll describe in a second. In other words, these weren't uh, warriors that just stayed within the Hellenic Republic fighting Turks, but in fact, uh, they were throughout the Mediterranean fighting. I think we mentioned another time that uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, uh, from the shores of, uh, of Montezuma to the, I mean, from the you know, walls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, uh, Hellenic fighters were actually in the shores of Tripoli, so there were very few Americans actually fighting, uh, Marines fighting, but in fact they were mercenaries, Hellenic mercenaries. In this particular case, uh, they were from Crete. The reason why I'm bringing up these things is because uh, uh, everyone should understand not every area of the Hellenic, Re uh, what became the Hellenic Republic, was actually under severe occupation where people were in control. In fact, there were whole sections of the, of the, of the nation that were independent. Himara was independent, Suli was independent, and Manu was independent. And, and also the Hellenic, the Hellenic, uh, the current Hellenic Republic is, is uh, and Greece itself is a very mountainous area. And as such, even though we talk about the warrior societies, these are the established warrior societies that are written about in books, the reality is a lot of these mountains had, in fact, uh, their various captains, capitans, as we say. And they also, there were also areas where, in fact, uh, the Turks were not going, but they paid taxes. Those people paid taxes. Another group that becomes very important to the discussion of the revolution is the Kleftes and Armatoli. When, when, uh, when the Turks first came into, into uh, continental Europe, and they conquered some of the areas. They couldn't control certain areas at all. In particular, they couldn't control the mountain passes and the people who were in the mountains. And in fact, the Armatoli became part of the, the, let's say, Turkish warrior system because they hired them to control the, the mountains. And, and the Armatoli became a hereditary position over time where in fact, uh, various uh, Armatoli captains controlled various areas, and they were almost uh, in control of those areas, except they paid taxes again. The Kleftes, the Kleftes uh, uh, as they say in history books, uh, sometimes they were Armatoli. When they were chased by the Turks, the Armatoli, they became Kleftes. After they, the Turks couldn't beat them, 
they decided to say, okay, here's some money, become a martoli again, and this cycle would go over and over again. The martoli were mostly in, in, northern, in northern Greece, central and northern Greece. In the, uh, in the Peloponnese, so even though they talk about martoli, the reality is most of them were, were basically cleftists. And uh, the reason I'll explain in a second, uh, it has to do with the fact that um, uh, with the Venetian Wars from, uh, from 1685 to 1715, when actually the Moriao, the Peloponnesus, was, was actually liberated. And when the Turks came back in in uh, 1715, they wiped out the concept of Armatoyi in the Moriao or the Peloponnesus. Besides, besides all these warrior societies, uh, clefts, mercenaries, uh, you, had, uh, you had a series of extremely wealthy Hellenic people. Uh, they were the, uh, for example, the Fanariotes, and it's, uh, they're from Constantinople, and in the area around the Fanar, where, where the, the current uh, patriarch is located. Uh, they call it the, the Fanar because in the old days, in the, in the past, there used to be a Fanari in the area or a, a, light, a lighthouse, let's say, in the area. Uh, there were very many of the Fanariotes. You had the dragomen who were basically interpreters to the, to the empire. Uh, all the diplomats, by the way, were not, uh, that were dealing with other nations. For the most part, they weren't Turks. They were, in fact, uh, Hellenic people, uh, sometimes Romanians, uh, as sometimes, as, uh, as Samati would say, Arbanites. Uh, then you had the maritime merchants uh, who became, again, very wealthy. And, and what, what they were doing is uh, supplying everyone who's fighting around Europe. As a matter of fact, they became extremely wealthy during the uh, Napoleon Wars because they were, they were basically bringing in food supplies and transferring weapons and things of that nature to both sides. So they became very wealthy. You have then the merchants and the bankers Many people, you know, they look, at, they look at the Hellenic Republic, they look at what happened during the revolution. You have to go back to the map that we showed where the Hellenic people were. And the Hellenic people were, were basically a cosmopolitan people, extremely wealthy in many cases, whether it was in Northern Africa, where, whether it was on what is, now, what, is now, uh, what is now Western Turkey, let's say, whether it's Constantinople, or whether it's further north. And when we talk about the merchants, there were literally tens of thousands of merchants all over the world, and among the, the wealthiest people. What we see here is a list of some of the Fanariotes, and the first one, I, I cut off the bottom and I cut off the top, but the first one I have there is uh, Gika, okay? Uh, Gika is from uh, the Gikei, were very wealthy uh, Fanariotes, and we have one of their representatives here, Stamatis Gikas. A very, very wealthy family. Also, the Gikei, uh, just on a separate note, uh, were fr from Himata originally, and they were, they were among the most fantastic warriors uh, of Himata. There was various captains from the, the Gika clan, and they fought in, uh, in many of the wars, in particular the, uh, the Russian wars against, against the Turks. The Gikei were basically mer mercenaries uh, for the Russians. Then you had, uh, going back to the merchants, just understand, you said to yourself, well, if there were tens of thousands of merchants everywhere, including Russia, including uh, what is now the Ukraine, including Poland, including France, all these areas, how come they just didn't stay there? Well, the reason why they didn't stay there is because they had their family members captive within, within the Ottoman Empire. In other words, they allowed the merchants to go out, make their money and all the rest of it, but meanwhile, they had, they had their sons, they had uh, sometimes their wives, and uh, they knew they were going to come back. So that's why they just didn't disappear into the, uh, these other areas. You had uh, various Hellenes of the uh, uh, diaspora. And uh, for example, this is just a couple of examples. One is uh, Alexander Ypsilantis, who becomes well known, obviously, when he, when he leads um, you know, his particular, his particular uh, you know, war, let's say, in the north. And you have uh, Ioannis Kapodistrias, you have various poets. And again, this marching class, uh, when they became wealthy, they would send their children uh, into the West to get educated. So you, you'd have uh, members of these classes 
uh, actually being uh, filled with Western ideas and all the rest of that. And we'll discuss you know, the influence of that in, in a second. In Russia itself, uh, uh, you had uh, Yanis Kapodistes was actually, was actually the foreign minister of the, uh, of the Russian Tsar. And uh, Alexander Ypsilantis was, a, was an officer also in, in Russia. They, uh, Russia also had a, train, a school where they, uh, they trained the soldiers, uh, in particular from uh, the Hellenic areas. So there's a whole uh, cadre of people who went through the universities. You had, uh, during that period, the uh, Hellenic Enlightenment, which was affected, obviously, by the European Enlightenment. So you had, you had uh, people like uh, Rigas Vereos. Uh, Rigas uh, actually was, was one who talked about the revolution years before the revolution started. Uh, but his, his uh, dream was a little bit different. His dream was not so much a Hellenic revolution, but his revolution was basically a revolution of the, of the Romyi, or a revolution of the Balkans. When we say Romyi, understand who the Romyi were. The Romyi were not just Hellenic people. They were every one of the Orthodox faith. So the Romyi included, for example, what we now know as Romanians. The Romyi included what, what we now know as Serbians, or what we now know as Bulgarians. And his, uh, his writings were actually translated into all the languages that we're, that we're talking about. Demantios uh, Korais, uh, many of us know him uh, on the linguistic sense because he created uh, Katarebusa, uh, which was supposed to be an in-between language between the Vimotikor, which was spoken at the time in Greece, to the ancient. So he wanted a language in between so the Hellenic people, once they were liberated, would actually drift to the ancient, the ancient Greek as a, as a language. Korais was uh, an intellectual, a writer. Uh, he, he also had, uh, when uh, Thomas Jefferson was in uh, France as the ambassador uh, from, the, uh, from the US, uh, Korais and him were very friendly and exchanged a lot of, a lot of ideas with each other. Then you have the influence of the Fidiki Eteria, uh, or the Society of Friends. And these are the three founders of the Fidiki Eteria. Uh, the Fidiki Eteria was, was uh, a fraternity. I'm not going to say they were like a HEPA, but yeah, they were a fraternity. And uh, these gentlemen uh, started the Fidiki Eteria. Uh, they secretly wanted to overthrow the Ottoman Empire and liberate the uh, Elas, what we know now as Elas, and they started with three people in Odessa. What were they doing in Odessa? As we said before, there was a tremendous amount of Hellenes in, in Odessa, and as a matter of fact, um, for those who don't know, Odessa at that particular time was mostly, was mostly Greek, because what happened was, uh, with all the wars that, uh, that the uh, northern Epirotes from Himara fought, in multiple wars against, against the Turks, uh, Russia actually gave Odessa, when they restarted Odessa, let's say, to the, to the Greeks. So there was a tremendous population there of Hellenes. And these gentlemen started with this fraternity, and at that particular time, there were many fraternities in, uh, in Europe. And this particular fraternity blossomed. Their goal, again, was to unite in a secret society to overthrow the Ottoman Empire and their expansion was unbelievable. Actually, th there's whole lists of people who were part of the Fidiki Eteria, and some of the greatest heroes of the revolution were, at, as a matter of fact, uh, members of the Fidiki Eteria. We talk about the National Awakening, and the reason why I'm bringing up some of these points is people just think that you know everybody was under Ottoman rule, and all of a sudden you know the war broke out, and, and and uh, you know the Hellenic, you know what became the Hellenic Republic was was liberated, but the reality is, from the fall of Constantinople into into this particular time of 1821, it was constant warfare, constant warfare, and uh, uh, historians call uh, this period the uh, that I'm mentioning up above. I changed the period, by the way. They started at 17, 1715. I prefer to start at 1685. Uh, but this is known as the Hellenic, uh, National, Hellenic National Awakening. 
There was a lot of external factors relating to what was taking place in the awakening. There were the Venetians that we discussed a second ago. There were the Russians, uh, which we'll discuss further. There was the Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars. Very important uh, time period, uh, 1685 to 1715. This was the, the war in the And basically, uh, uh, many of you, even though you may not know what this war is about, you know one symbol of the war of the Moria. And that's when Morosini lobbed a bomb on the, uh, on the Acropolis and basically blew up the Parthenon. Okay, that was during this particular war. Uh, so around the 1880s, uh, uh, the Parthenon that you see today uh, was a completely different Parthenon at that particular time. The Parthenon, which was the ancient uh, temple of Athena, uh, became a church after, after uh, Christianity. It was a church for about a thousand years, for those who don't know. Uh, when, the, when the Turks finally took over the area, they converted it into uh, an armory. And basically, the, uh, the, uh, the cannon fire that uh, Morosini lobbed on the, uh, on the uh, Parthenon was the one that caused the damage that you see today, and they blew it up. So between these particular times, the, uh, you had the Kingdom of the Moria, which was controlled by the Venetians. And, um, and the, the Turks didn't exist in the Moria at that particular time. However, what's, uh, what's also very important is the Moria War. When we talk about the Venetians came in, Morosini and all that, who are the soldiers of Morosini? We don't have time to talk about it, but they were basically a group of people called the Stratiotes, who were among the fiercest fighters in the world at that particular time. And as a matter of fact, they're very important also in Venetian history because they saved Venice. Uh, they were warriors that came out of uh, what used to be the Byzantine Empire, that went into, into the West, and the cavalry, the particular cavalry known as the Stratiotes, was the most feared cavalry in the world, and they were hired again as mercenaries. And the way they would be paid, basically, is by, is by the head. In other words, when we think of people cutting people's heads off, it wasn't only the Turks, quite frankly, it was also the Greeks. They would, they would cut off people's heads and then give them, uh, give them for, the, uh, for the bounty. In 1711, you had the Prout campaign, and uh, that's when Peter the Great, uh, you know, uh, started to talk about the Orthodox people and, uh, you know, belief in the fatherland. Don't forget, what the Russians wanted to do, basically, was to recreate the Byzantine Empire under their leadership, and they thought that they had the power to do that. The Sultan, though, being intelligent, said, oh, hold it, these guys will want to, uh, you know, bring all these people together to create the Byzantine Empire. So what he did was appointed uh, Hellenic governors of Wallachia and Moldavia, which was, which was right, before, right before Russia. And as a matter of fact, one of the, uh, one of the governors, some of them became princes, was in the Gikas clan. Correct, Mr. Gikas? Uh, then you had a series of Russian wars against, against the Ottomans. 1717, 1737, 39, etc. All these wars, again, were fought, were fought with more Hellenic mercenaries. Just so everyone understands, there wasn't just these people that were occupied. The Hellenic people were basically around the world at that particular time, fighting all types of battles. One of the most important events that took place, really, and uh, sort of helped create the, the feeling of, of, of rebelling, had to do with the or Orloff Rebellion, which took place in 17... Uh, uh, 69, 1770. The rebellion started when uh, some Russians came on a boat. They said, uh, you know, the Russians, uh, you know, rise up, Hellenes. The Russians are coming, and uh, you know, we will help you. We will support you. And so, you know, in the Morga or in the Peloponnesus, they rose. They rose. And when they rose, uh, the Russians weren't there. So uh, what happened was a brutal, brutal warfare took place between about uh, 1769 to around 1780. Ten years, ten years of warfare took place uh, in the Peloponnesus. And that's how, that's how you have, for example, Polopotronius, he was born under a tree. Remember, he was born in Messenia under a tree, even though his family was in Arcadia. The reason he was born under a tree, because in 1770, his family and a whole bunch of families had to go on the run. And that's why he was born in, in Messina. During that particular time period, one third of the population of the Peloponnesus fled the Peloponnesus. Cities were burned, well there weren't too many cities, towns were burned, uh, all types of bad things happened until finally in, uh, in uh, 17, 
1780, you had the Capitan Pasha uh, linked up, linked up with the uh, with the Cleftis. Actually, it was uh, uh, one of the Cleftis was uh, called Cotroni's father, Costisco Cotroni's, because the people who were run, run, uh, running rampant to a certain degree was the people that were unleashed by the Sultan, and that was the uh, what they called the Arbanal Turki. They were in that period for about 10 years. And uh, in order to defeat them, actually, the Sultan asked to combine, to combine with, the, um, with his forces. And the Cleftis actually ended up wiping them out in Tripolitza. Then you had a war, uh, of, uh, or the treaty, uh, where Russia became the protector of the Orthodox. And then, of course, you had the Napoleonic Wars. This becomes very important, uh, you know, the Napoleonic Wars, because it, it sets into motion what took place when the, when the revolution started. And that had to do with the fact that, we'll discuss in a second, the Age of, the, uh, the age of Enlightenment, and the fact that uh, you had revolutionary things taking place, and right after the Congress of Vienna, no one was interested in revolutionary uh, concepts or ideas. They weren't in support of those at all. And this, you see the time frame is 18, 1815. And again, if you look at the way the uh, Europe is broken up, there was no Italy at that particular time. Italy was broken up into different areas. You see the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You see the, uh, you know, the uh, German Federation, France, and, and Britain. The Age of Enlightenment changed a lot of things and created a, a you know, a, a time period of revolution. I'm not going to go through these these different things here, but basically, you know, the Age of Enlightenment encouraged concepts of liberty, uh, constitutional government, tolerance, fraternity, liberalism, and you had all these major figures like Rousseau, Kant, Hume, Adam Smith, and all these ideas were being passed passed around between between uh, universities, salons, coffee houses, debating societies, and Masonic lodges. At the same time, and, and that, that basically created, created the atmosphere for, the, for the, French, the French Revolution. It became problematic later for the Hellenic people. Also during that time, there was a, a Helleno mania, and Phil Hellenism was taking place. Uh, People were studying, you know, ancient Alas. People were going, uh, for example, in, in, uh, travelers into Europe. There was all types of literary and popular Philhellenism and books written about Hellenic art, about Hellenic architecture, about Hellenic government. All these, all these fantastic things uh, that that really sparked this uh, these concepts, revolutionary concepts, to to a lot of Europeans. Then there was Byron. Byron was the rock star of this particular period. He was, he was an absolute rock star. Uh, he, went, uh, he went and traveled throughout the area, throughout what is uh, uh, now Greece. Uh, and in particular, he was in the uh, court of Ali Pasha. For those of you who were here last year, we did a whole event, actually, uh, in the court of Ali Pasha, Child Harold uh, Reconsidered. And his book that he wrote, uh, uh, Child Harold's pilgrimage was the most read book in Europe. It was like unbelievable. And it had to do with the court of Ali Pasha. And he started in his, in his poetry and in the poetry of, of the other people who followed him was the concept was building up. Look at these people, they're enslaved, etc. And you know, this is just one fragment of it where he, a very famous fragment where he talks about the mountains look on on Marathon, Marathon looks on the sea, and using there an hour alone, I dreamt that Greece might be free. So these things were, were in the minds of, of Europeans. Then you have America. America was also part of this, uh, part of this age, the rebellious age. And uh, everything that we talk about here in terms of the Age of Enlightenment and uh, revolution uh, took place in the United States. And then the important thing, and it'll come back to us a little bit later in the, in the presentation, is uh, the beginning, the preamble of the Constitution, we the people.
We talked about uh, Shelley and America being the embodiment of Pilhellenism. We talked about Jefferson and Cordais, and, and certainly we'll talk a little bit later about the Monroe Doctrine. But when you think about America, think about our Constitution, think about our Declaration of Independence. Think about all these people who actually spoke the Hellenic language. As a matter of fact, they voted uh, initially, what language would they have in the United States? And they actually voted to see if they would speak the Hellenic language because many of them did. They were highly educated people. One of the precursors uh, and the spark of the revolution had to do with Ali Basia. As I indicated earlier, he had become very powerful. And, uh, and Mehmet, uh, Mahmoud uh, the second was very concerned about him. There's an incident that took place in, uh, in Constantinople where actually Ali Pasha sent some assassins to kill one of the uh, Sultan's people. Um, the assassins were captured, they grilled the assassins and they said it came from Ali Pasha to, to kill this particular person. And then Ali, Ali uh, uh, or the Sultan basically uh, sent an army to invade, to invade and take over uh, the kingdom of Ali Pasha. This was the spark of the revolution. This happened around, uh, around the end of, of 1820. And you say, why did it spark the revolution? What happened was this. Europe was not interested in revolutions at all. Ali, Ali Pasha was, uh, uh, the, the Ottoman Empire was, was basically fighting Ali Pasha to take over. He was very powerful, by the way. He didn't go down until 1822. So they had major armies, and one of the things that happened, one of the, uh, uh, the original commander didn't do so well against Ali Pasha. So what he did was, he, he actually, the Sultan asked for the, uh, the Pasha who was in the, the Moria or the Peloponnesus to go and head the army, okay? And when that particular general left, okay, which was towards the end of 2000, uh, 18, 1820, is when, is when people said, this is the time to invade, to invade the Moria. At that particular time, what was taking place is the Filiki Eteria had sent out the word. They had talked about starting the revolution around, around March 15th because of the religious holiday. Uh, but the, the clefts, many of them who were uh, on the run, basically, and in the Ionian Islands, started to come back into the Moria. In other words, they were fugitives, basically, in the islands started to come back towards the end of uh, uh, 1820. And uh, also what you had was the uh, Sudotes who were forced out by Ali in, uh, in 1803, uh, themselves were asked by the Ottomans to come and go to war against Ali. So the Sudotes left uh, Kerkera, headed towards uh, uh, Ipiros to fight, to fight uh, against Ali, who they hated, who they hated. They were promised by the Ottomans money, and they were promised by the Ottomans that they would be able to take over Sudi again because uh, Ali had taken over Sudi. Uh, they reneged during this uh, warfare that took place, and the Sudotis turned around and basically, basically went to Ali's side, actually, and supported Ali against the Ottomans. Uh, the reason why I bring up the Sudotis and uh, some of the warriors who had gone into the islands is when they went into the islands in 1803, and they were then having relationships with Kleftis, et cetera, from, from the Moria, who were also there, that's when you started to have uh, a mixture of Hellenes that started to feel for each other as being more than Suyotes, or being more than Moraitis. And they started to think of being more as uh, Hellenes. The outbreak of the revolution, uh, started actually in, in the Danubian provinces uh, towards the end, of, towards the end of, um, of February. And here you have Ypsilantis in the famous uh, Von Hess uh, print uh, uh, proclaiming fight for faith and fatherland. The time has come for Hellenes. Of course, this was not a very successful operation. He thought he was going to come there and all the um, all the uh, Romiotis would uh, go on his side, meaning the people who were in the Danubian areas, but uh, they really were, not, were not, not that interested, quite frankly, and he ended up 
all his troops ended up getting wiped out, including the sacred, the famous sacred battalion. The biggest part of the outbreak of the revolution took place in the Moriah, the Peloponnesian. So we had mentioned before all the different uprisings that had taken place there. One of the most important events that took place in, uh, in the Moriah had to do with the secret assembly at Bostitsa that took place in January of 1821. Uh, it was uh, all the uh, chieftains of the area, all the, pro, uh, the prelates, all the civil leaders uh, were there. This is from a stamp. Uh, and they clash with Papa Flesses. The reason why they uh, uh, clash with Papa Flesses, Papa Flesses was one of the leaders of the Fidikiateria in the Moria. What he was telling everybody basically was that the Russians are going to support, uh, you know, the Hellenic Revolution and to rise. Uh, when they went to the uh, to this particular uh, conference, uh, Papa Flesses said the same thing, and basically the leaders said, "Well, how do we how do we know this is going to happen?" Let's not start the revolution right now. Let's send some ambassadors to the Russian court to find out what's going on, if they're going to come, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do. Uh, he clashed with them. You know, as a matter of fact, they almost arrested him because he went crazy. Obviously, the Russians weren't coming. But well, one thing that he did say was, um, at that particular conference, very famous statement. He said, give me the sambasotes, the Pisohoritas and a thousand Manyatas, and I will start the revolution myself. The Pisohoritas were basically uh, people from the Arcadian area. I'm not sorry, the, uh, the Sambasotas were people from the Arcadian area. The uh, Pisohoritas were the people in the uh, Laconian area, all of the northern Tahitos, and of course, you know who the Manyatas were. And in fact, what he said came to pass. It came to pass because the revolution, the revolution started uh, after this particular incident where you had the Manyatis declare war on March 17th against the Ottoman Empire, and where you had the Sambasotes and the Pisohorites come down from the Tayetos Mountains, and they both headed towards Kalamata. And the first war of the uh, Hellenic uh, Revolution was the, oh, the first battle was the Battle of Kalamata, which they captured again on uh, March 23rd, uh, 1821. This, uh, this map over here shows the various casta, uh, the various casta that uh, fell in, uh, in the Moria. And understand uh, that, um, well, this is important to understand. While all this was taking place, while the cleftus was there, they rose, etc. They started, they started warfare. Uh, there was also reprisals taking place in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. For example, there was, there was the program that took place in Constantinople. Uh, cities were burned. Uh, as we all know, uh, the patriarch on, on Easter, uh, right before Easter, was basically hung by the Ottomans uh, in front of the doorway to St. George, uh, you know, the cathedral. And basically, people, in order to observe Easter, had to push his body aside to walk through the, the entryway uh, of the church. They took his body, they cut down the, you know, his body that was hanging from there, and they threw it into the Bosporus, and it was later picked up by, by some Hellenes. But there were massacres that took place throughout the, the Ottoman Empire. You had tens of thousands of people that were killed in Constantinople, in, uh, in uh, the Smyrna area, for example, and, and a lot of these towns and cities. And in particular, the clergy were rounded up because as we indicated before when we talked about the millets, the rum millet, the leaders, the civil leaders, or the leaders of the Orthodox people were in fact the priests. So the, the priests, the clergy in particular, uh, they went after them. And I'm, I'm mentioning that because I want to mention something else that's not mentioned a lot, but I, but I have to mention it. When, in fact, the revolution started, and it started in the Moria earlier, it started in around January, uh, first in Ilia, Ilia, which is towards the west, uh, then it started around the Calabrita area, and then what I mentioned before about the uh, Sambasotis and the Maniates uh, coming into, into play. Within a month, within a month, there were, there were no, no Turks in the Moria. They were all killed. Those that survived went into the various castla or the castles. Tripolitsa, for example, was, was the main castro. 
on a basya, horn, not clear. So the population had to flee. When we talk about the Turks of the Morya, for example, and we say the Turks, they were not ethnic Turks per se. They were people who were what we call Turkified, who were Hellenes basically that became Muslims. Once you became a Muslim, uh, as far as everybody was concerned, you were, you were basically a Turk. And uh, so there was massacres there. And then these are the falls of the different, uh, uh, different fortifications, uh, Tripolitsa being the most, the most violent. Uh, just about everyone was massacred in Tripolitsa when they, when they took it over. Uh, and, and it fell in, uh, in October. So when Vasa, everybody was wiped out. Some people survived. In Tripolitsa, just about everybody was wiped out. In Corinth, some people were left and, uh, and survived. Uh, in central Alas, you had Athanasius Diakos, who was finally captured by the Turks and roasted. We know the famous uh, sayings that he had. But one thing that happened, uh, okay, let's talk about the Turk, uh, uh, Omir Brioni. He was very famous for having what he called the Hellenic hunts. What he used to do before the revolution was he basically would round up any Greeks that he found in the, in the countryside and basically ask them to run. And then he had troops and they would go there basically and shoot everybody and cut off their heads as part of the, uh, the hunt. Uh, one of the greatest, there were two uh, main battles that took place uh, uh, that stopped the armies and one was, one was the, uh, the, the Battle of Vasiliki, which stopped one army. The other, obviously, in the, in the Moria had to do with uh, Dervenakia, the Battle of Dervenakia, where, in fact, uh, another major Ottoman uh, army was defeated. When those armies were defeated, those two major armies that were basically coming from the north, the Moria itself was basically, there were, there were no Turks there at all. They were in complete control. Meanwhile, on the, on the various islands, from Cyprus to Crete, uh, you had a situation where, where when the uh, um, military was defeated, the Ottoman military was defeated in these battles that I mentioned, uh, and there was a lot of battles, uh, the Sultan had to go basically to the Pastel of Egypt, um, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali of Egypt, and, and ask him for his help. And what he did was he put together a, a huge military force that invaded a lot of the islands. And that's why, that's why the revolution never took hold in those particular islands. Like in Crete, there was violent you know, uh, warfare in Crete. But, but um, uh, Muhammad Ali's um, troops under his son, really, Ibrahim Pasha, uh, took care of that. In, in, in Cyprus, they, uh, they wiped out a lot of the, uh, the religious figures, and, and you'll see some of the quotes that we have here from, <clears throat> for example, Archbishop Kiprianos of Cyprus, uh, 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 relating to Mehmet's threat to wipe out the Hellenes of Cyprus. Hellenism was born when the world was born. Not until the whole world ends will the Hellenic race vanish. Uh, that's only part of what, of what he said. So we have a situation where also many people say, well, you know, the, uh, the Cypriots, what were they doing at that particular time? The Cypriots fought in the Hellenic Revolution very bravely. As a matter of fact, uh, Canaris brought a whole, uh, you know, shiploads of, of Cypriots who were fighting in Greece. Uh, over a thousand warriors were, were from Cyprus, and about three or four hundred of them uh, actually perished in, in the various wars there. Then we have the war at sea. Uh, you had uh, particular islands that, uh, that uh, maintained uh, their own squadrons. Uh, they were from Idra, from Spetsis, from uh, Epsara in particular. Uh, Canaris uh, was uh, very famous in the war. And one of the, one of the techniques that they used was, were these fire ships. And uh, this, particular, uh, this particular print has to do with the, uh, with the fire ship, which was the command fire ship, actually, of the Pasha. That, uh, that was uh, destroyed uh, by uh, Dimitris Papanikolas. We did it. Meanwhile, the great powers, they, they had no interest in helping the revolution. As a matter of fact, they were anti-revolution. They were anti-revolution. But remember, you had the, Hel you know, the Hellenes and Phil Hellenes of the, of the, of the exterior, the diaspora, the Philhellenic, we the people, 
the intellectuals, the professors, they rallied. No one recognized the revolution, the Hellenic Revolution, even though they sent letters to, to every place. The first nation to recognize the Hellenic Revolution was Haiti. And part of it had to do with the fact that uh, obviously they had their own revolution. And uh, they expressed support. They didn't, they didn't have money. They didn't have money. But what they did was they had uh, a coffee. So, uh, so the president sent 25 tons of coffee uh, to Greece to be sold in the marketplace so the Hellenes can buy weapons. And also, again, uh, historians haven't been able to verify this, but it will be one day verified. A hundred Haitians went on a ship and actually headed towards Greece to help in the revolution. But, uh, but historians uh, say basically that uh, pirates basically took over the ship. No, no one knows what happened to the hundred, uh, the hundred uh, uh, Haitians. So all these nations were against the revolution. They literally shut down every port in Europe. The only port that was open, I'm talking about every port in Europe, from Italy all the way into, into uh, Great Britain. Every port was shut down. The only port that was open that allowed some people to come in, people were able to take ships, was in Marseille. That's why I say the road to, uh, to, uh, to Marseille. So all these different people, you know, all these intellectuals, all these people who were rallied by their professors, all these people who were at the salons, basically headed towards Marseille. And you had uh, a couple of battalions that were established. One was a battalion of Philhellenes, and the other was the uh, uh, German uh, Legion uh, Battalion. <coughs> it's, important, it's important to understand that it's not that they had armies to go there to help Greece. But the mere fact that they were going there, and the mere fact that they were reporting back, and the mere fact that people knew that they were there was a big deal. And even though, and this is where, this is where the mindset comes in, even though a lot of them were really, were really defeated, you know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't take the people that they were with, they couldn't take, for example, the clefts, who looked at them and you know, said, like, what is this all about? Because their fighting styles were completely different. The cleft, the armatoli, their fighting styles were mountain-oriented, and it had to do with the way they shot guns and the way they fought in the mountains. They basically went from rock to rock and basically retreated and allowed the people to come in. The Europeans couldn't basically, couldn't understand that. So a lot of people went back and had a lot of negative things to say about, about what, what was taking place in Greece, about the massacres also that we discussed a second ago. But no one was listening. No one was listening because what was happening is everyone was filled with the love of Elas, the love of the ancients, and all the things their professors were telling them. This is uh, uh, you know, just a chart of Philhellenes by nationality when they arrived in Greece and, uh, and their deaths. Uh, there's cataloged at least 1,000 that went in, about 300 or so were, were killed. And this shows the nations uh, you know, to the left and the time period that they came. And understand, I'm not going to go through the history of the revolution, but understand that once they took over the, the Moria and they took over a lot of areas, as was mentioned before, civil wars broke out. Civil wars broke out, and that became a problem. Then you had, again, when uh, war, civil wars were breaking out and all that, and people said, oh, look at these guys, look what they're doing. Boom, Lord Byron joins the cause. So on, on July 13, uh, 18, 1823, he left Genoa in a chartered vessel. He brought with him some medicine, some uniforms, and 50,000 Spanish dollars. And uh, with that, he formed the uh, Byron Brigade, made up mostly of uh, Sudot warriors. And uh, he died in uh, Missolonghi in, in 1825. His heart, of course, is still in our lives. American Philhellenes. The Americans were, were, were a different type. They didn't come there and form their own, their, their own units. They actually came into Greece and joined Hellenic units. So for example, you have uh, George Jarvis, very famous. Uh, he was a New Yorker. He was the first American to join the cause. Uh, he actually walked. He was actually in Europe at the time, and he walked 
from like the German states to Marseille on foot. And he boarded a ship and he, and he joined the Kleftas. Uh, he learned the Hellenic language, he wore a Fustanella, and he fought in many battles. Uh, he became known as Cap Capitan Zervos. He was captured initially in the war with other, with other, um, with other Hellenes. Uh, there were a couple of uh, members of the Mavro Michale who were also captured and they were early in the war. They were traded, they were traded for, uh, for Ottomans. And uh, he was there, you know, when Karaskaki died because he was one of, one of his adjuncts in the, war that, in the war they had for the Battle of Athens where Karaskaki died. You had the most famous uh, Phil Hellene, uh, Dr. Samuel uh, Gridley Howe. He was a, he was a famous uh, physician. Uh, he enlisted in the army. He was, in, he was in, in Greece for six years as a chief surgeon and established a, me a medical center in Aegina and a school uh, for the blind in Corinth. Then you had Captain Jonathan Miller, who also wore a Fustanella. Uh, who also fought in a lot of battles. He adopted uh, a four-year-old uh, Helene, who became the first, the first member of Congress later uh, from Wisconsin, uh, uh, Lucas Mubiadis Miller. We have uh, James Williams, an African-American from Baltimore, who served honorably in the Hellenic Naval Forces. We have George uh, Wilson, who died during the Battle of Naptahos. And we have uh, William Townsend uh, Washington, who was a distant relative of George Washington, uh, who fell heroically in the Battle of Palamide. Here's George Jarvis, and his Fusanella. Here's Dr. Samuel Gridley Howell. So we're going to end. I'm not going to go into the, uh, the uh, other topics that had to do with uh, Ibrahim Pasha coming into the Morya in, uh, in 1825, who basically took over, you know, he came with the most massive fleet assembled in the, uh, in the East Mediterranean. Uh, he was, again, uh, you had the Sultan ask the uh, Muhammad uh, Ali of uh, Egypt uh, to help him. He promised him Cyprus. He promised him uh, Crete. And he promised him the Moria to be part of his territory. And that's why he sent a huge fleet. Ibrahim uh, Pasha, when he came in in 1825, it was a period, it was a period right before where you had the various uh, civil wars the, uh, between the, uh, the leadership uh, of, the new, of the new republic. And uh, as a matter of fact, Paulo Cotronius was in jail. And when, and when um, Ibrahim uh, Pasha landed, and they saw what force he came with, with the ships that he came with. That's when they released him from the jail, basically. And the first, uh, the first uh, expeditionary force that went, went against Ali, Ali Pasha was, uh, was Papa Flesas and, and uh, Capitan Kefalas uh, in the Battle of Maniaki, which is, which is referred to as the, as the modern Battle of the 300, because all of them lost their lives. There were about, there were more than 300, just like in the Battle of Thermopylae, there were more than 300. But they lost their lives, and in, in terms of, uh, uh, for those, we know Papa Flesas, for those who don't know who Cap, uh, Capitan Kefalas was, Capitan Kefalas is uh, the person on that famous, uh, that famous Van Hess print that puts the flag on Tripolitsa. He was a very powerful uh, Capitan during that particular period and a general, and a general uh, during the war. So, what is, what is the lesson? What is the lesson? Let's see. Okay, I'll tell you what the lesson is. <laughs> <laughs> we, talked about, we talked about we the people. And, uh, and the reason why I mentioned some of the things the way I mentioned them, and I didn't talk about other things, about heroes and all the rest of that, is, is because, again, it's about the people. It's about the Hellenic people, certainly their leadership, but it's about the people. It's about the Philhellenes, the people. It's about America, the people, again, Philhellenes. And it's about we, the people, which is in the beginning of the Declaration of Independence of the Hellenic Republic, okay? In their declaration, 
they use the terminology loosely translated, we the people, you know, who are going against the Ottomans and all the rest of that type of stuff. So the lessons uh, are uh, what we talked about, but also the lessons of what Dr. Kutras mentioned initially. It's very important for the Hellenic Republic what we in the diaspora do. We have an influence. It's very important, and we didn't mention it before where we talked about the governments not stepping in, but in reality, what happened was the governments were forced to step in. You all know about the, the final episode where they destroyed Ibrahim Pasha's uh, ships, where you had the fleets of Russia, England, and France, and they, you know, because of an accident of what the Turks unfortunately made a mistake, but they wiped out their fleet. That was the end of the war. The statement is, we the people have an influence. We the people, even though the governments don't want it, have that influence for the governments to help. And uh, it, it ties back again to what Dr. Kutras indicated. We have to support uh, the Hellenic Republic. It's a serious time for them right now. The geopolitics of what we talked about earlier, different nations perhaps, although Russia's in there, France is not in there really, and England is not there, but the Ottoman, the so-called Neo-Ottoman Empire that Erdogan refers to on occasion is there. And the geopolitics of that particular region are very important. They're very important to everyone in the EU. They're very important to the United States of America. And again, things are not, things are different, but they're, they're not so different. And as Heraclitus said, the, the ancient philosopher, I'm just making this up right now, but it's true, as he said, you never walk the same river twice, but the reality is it's the same river. Thank you for coming tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming to all of us.